Wonderful. I think we're going to get started. There might still be a few um, folks trickling in, but we'll get started with the presentation today. Uh, so welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon uh, to talk about protection in the Bay of Fundy. Um, I wanna start off by thanking the NBEN for helping us on this event, uh, for helping us uh, put it all together and being on the call today to support the event. Um, I'm Danielle Hack. I'm the Conservation Education Coordinator with the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society New Brunswick chapter. Um, before we dive into it, I want to just share a few housekeeping pieces um, about the call today. Uh, so there will be interpretation available for the event today. If you've not yet found the channel for um, French or English interpretation, it should be at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, we have two interpreters on today uh, who will be here for the presentation as well as the Q&A at the end. Uh, so thank you so much for interpreting for us today. Um, the, the webinar is going to start with a presentation from about now in, until um, for about the next 45 minutes. We'll then have about 45 minutes for a question and answer period. Um, if you have any questions or comments uh, throughout the duration of the presentation, um, please feel free to add them in the chat. We'll be answering the questions at the end, but you can add questions or comments at any point to the chat uh, during the presentation. Um, also, just so everyone knows, we are recording this webinar. So if you don't wanna be on the recording, if you just wanna leave your video off and microphone muted so that you aren't um, included on the recording, but just wanted to let everyone know that uh, this is being recorded so that we can share it uh, after, the, after the presentation. So next I'd like to introduce my colleagues um, from CPAWS. Uh, first, we have Riley Lavender, who's the conservation campaigner um, and will be supporting behind the scenes today. Um, if you have any questions that you don't want to put into the general chat, please feel free to email Riley and she'll be able to help you with any um, questions. Or if there's anything that you want to send directly to CPAWS, please feel free uh, to send her a message. Um, also uh, joining today is Roberta Clowater, who will be leading the second half of the presentation today, but I'll pass it off to Roberta right now just to introduce herself. Thanks, Danielle. I'm Roberta Kloater. I'm the executive director of the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society New Brunswick chapter, and uh, I'm based in Fredericton on Willistic Way territory. Back to you, Danielle. Wonderful. Thanks, Roberta. So to begin our um, presentation today, um, and to begin our conversation, uh, we want to start by recognizing the land and the waterways where we're joining from and that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we can't talk about the Bay of Fundy and protecting these important waterways around us without acknowledging the role that Indigenous nations have had and continue to have in caring for these uh, lands and waters. Um, so I want to begin by expressing my gratitude by saying Wallalin and Waliwan to the Mi'kmaq, Wallistaque, and Peskotamakati nations who are the first caretakers of this land and who continue to be stewards for the land and waters around us. Um, Wallalin and Waliwan are the words for thank you in Mi'kmaq and Wallistaque. And I invite others to practice these words as we expect, express our gratitude for the indigenous teachers, elders and knowledge holders um, who teach us about caring for nature. Uh, the Bay of Fundy is within the territories of the Mi'kmaq, Wolstikwe, and Peskotamakati peoples. And at CPAWS New Brunswick, we know that we are all treaty people, and it is all of our responsibility to learn, uh, to learn from and listen to Indigenous peoples as we work to uh, protect this important place. Next, I want to share a little bit about CPAWS New Brunswick. For those who haven't uh, heard of us before or worked with us before, CPAWS stands for the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society, and we're the New Brunswick chapter of a nationwide charity. CPAWS New Brunswick is a conservation organization with a vision to protect land, freshwater, and ocean areas across New Brunswick to sustain nature um, uh, and people for current and future generations. Uh, as well, we work to ensure that parks are managed and protected for the nature within them. The New Brunswick chapter has been active since 2004, and we work with governments at all levels, community groups, and concerned citizens, just like yourselves, to find solutions to nature conservation challenges. And we always seek to do this in a way that respects the sovereignty and leadership of Indigenous nations. <clears throat> So why is conservation important? Uh, we want to start off this presentation by talking about uh, why conservation is so important 
And I want to preface this by saying that some folks on the webinar today uh, might work in conservation and be really familiar with some of the things we're going to be talking about, um, while others might be new to the world of conservation work. Uh, we feel it's a really important reminder for all of us um, to talk about why the work of conservation organizations here in New Brunswick is so important. Um, we also feel it's important to talk about conservation in a way that allows everyone to be involved in the conversation. This includes people who work in conservation, um, people who don't work in conservation but are really um, curious and interested in being involved in uh, environmental work, um, as well as decision makers in our community. We want to talk about conservation in a way um, that allows for all people to be a part of the conversation. So with all that being said, uh, conservation is important because we're all a part of nature. We rely on the nature around us um, and we play a really important role in uh, all the ecosystems around us. We need to conserve, limit and manage our use in order for nature around us to remain healthy and resilient. Conservation is also important for the health of um, our communities. The health of communities is directly tied to the health of the nature around us. We're seeing this more and more as we start to see the effects of climate change. Uh, nature is the solution that we need to address changes to our climate and weather patterns. The ecosystems around us provide flood control. It protects our food supplies. It protects communities from storm surges and does so much more. And protecting nature means protecting all of the benefits that it provides to us. But conservation is important, not just for us, but for all the species that live in the area. Nature is not just for humans, but it's for the plants and animals that call an area home as well. Conservation is important for all living creatures who need enough space to live. Um, and this includes areas to find food, to move, to migrate, to find shelter and mates and to adapt to changing conditions. So this includes the largest of species, like the whale that's on the screen here, all the way down to the smallest of species. Even the smallest animals like birds and fish need unique habitats um, to be protected to ensure that they have all that they need to live in these areas. Conservation is also so important because connections matter. We know that all things in nature are connected, different habitats like forests, rivers, and oceans, and all of the animals that live within them are connected. And conservation is necessary to ensure that all biodiversity um, in New Brunswick's coastal and ocean ecosystems have what they need to thrive. So what does this mean for the Bay of Fundy? Well, there's currently a number of issues facing the Bay of Fundy, which impacts the plants and animals that live in its coastal and ocean habitats. Um, there's also a variety of issues that impact the ecosystem as a whole. Uh, these issues are largely influenced by human actions, but made worse by climate change. Some of the key issues that we wanted to talk about today include that the Bay of Fundy is one of the fastest warming bodies of water in the world. This affects many creatures that live there um, that are adapted to the temperature and conditions of the bay. And if conditions change and waters continue to warm, they'll be forced to move, uh, relocate, and find new areas to live. Another issue that we're seeing is a decline of some fish populations. This in turn impacts a lot of other species that depend on fish's food, such as whales, porpoise, and shorebirds. Additionally, there are 22 endangered, threatened, or species of special concern that call the Bay of Fundy home. Now I won't name all 22 of these species, but some that you might be familiar with include the North Atlantic right whale, uh, white sharks, harbor porpoise, and the inner Bay of Fundy Atlantic salmon. We're also seeing an increase in shipping traffic, especially into the Port of St. John, which disrupts the movement of many of the animals that live in the Bay of Fundy. Now, these issues are significant on their own, but as I mentioned, um, all of nature is connected and each of these issues impact each other, creating worsening conditions in the Bay of Fundy. So what is actually protected in the Bay of Fundy? Well, this is a map that shows what's currently protected in New Brunswick, uh, illustrated by these red areas. You can see St. John in the middle marked by the gold star. Um, as you can see, almost all of the protected areas are on land. If we were to zoom into these coastal areas, you would see that protection actually stops at the high water line, uh, meaning none of the water itself is protected in these areas. 
This is true for both Fundy National Park and New River Beach Provincial Park, which are areas that um, some of you might be familiar with or maybe have visited. Um, protection in these parks actually stops at the high water line um, or where the tide comes in at its highest. So when you're visiting these parks and looking out over um, the beautiful ocean views out over the coast, um, none of the water um, that connects to these parks is protected. Now the blue arrow in um, the middle just down from St. John on this map here um, is actually the only marine protected area in the Bay of Fundy as of right now, and that's the Musquash Estuary. Maybe some folks are familiar with this too. You um, drive through it uh, if you were heading from St. John to New River Beach or um, further along the coast. Uh, and the Musquash Air Estuary is the only marine protected area in the Bay right now. Now you can see there's a pattern here where coastal areas are being protected, but they're not extending out into the water. And this is leaving a really large gap um, and a need to protect more ocean area out into the Bay. So now that we've had a chance to see what is and isn't being protected, uh, we wanna talk about what needs to be protected in the Bay of Fundy. Um, to best support the species, the plants and animals, all the biodiversity that live in and around the Bay of Fundy, it's important that we have a variety of protections, including coastal, near shore and ocean areas. It's also important to protect areas that act as feeding and breeding grounds, these areas have a high diversity of species as well as species at risk and must remain healthy in order to support all surrounding ecosystems. High productivity areas also allow for spillover into other areas, um, which is necessary for healthy fish populations as well as populations of many other species that call the Bay of Fundy home. It's also important that we're um, protecting, um, that, that protected areas reflect the diversity of ecosystems in the Bay including different habitats like mudflats, horse mussel reefs, feeding areas for whales and shorebirds, as well as other ecosystems that are found in the bay. Uh, and it's also really important to mention that when we're talking about what areas need to be protected, um, it's important that indigenous knowledge of plants, animals, and their habitats is reflected when determining what needs to be protected. So to wrap up my part of the presentation, I just want to sort of summarize a bit of what um, I've mentioned and talk about how protection helps. So protected areas help in a variety of ways and have many benefits. Um, first, protected areas ensure that important ecosystems remain intact. Intact ecosystems are necessary as we continue to experience the effects of climate change um, and futures become more unknown due to different climate impacts. Protected areas also ensure the health of species that we rely on, ensuring sustainable populations uh, well into the future. As well, protection also supports uh, rebuilding of fish and wildlife populations. And last but not least, uh, as well as many other um, benefits that, that I haven't mentioned, but protected areas can provide employment opportunities for those that live in coastal communities. And this can include anything from ecotourism operations, to research and monitoring of these protected areas, as well as opportunities like outdoor education programs and Indigenous Guardians programs. And I'll now pass it off to Roberta, who's going to talk a bit more about how we can be involved in protecting and conserving these important areas in the Bay of Fundy. Thanks, Danielle. So the first thing I would like to talk with you about is who's responsible for marine conservation. Uh, in, in my travels around New Brunswick, I often find that people think that it's up to governments to make decisions about what happens to the ocean around us. And I, I always wanna remind everybody that we all have a responsibility uh, to protect the Bay of Fundy and all the ocean that we interact with. Uh, in a way that's respectful and that we're leaving the smallest footprint that we can. And that we're not, if we're in a position where we're harvesting something from the Bay that we're not taking too much and then we're making sure we're leaving enough for, for nature and also for future generations. Of course, governments do have a big role to play and governments at all levels. And this includes indigenous governments 
the federal government, provincial governments, and, and occasionally municipal governments if they're in coastal communities. And um, legally speaking, from the constitutional perspective, the federal government has a lot of jurisdiction and authority over what happens in the ocean, the management of fish fisheries, for example, and how fisheries happen and where they happen. And um, also through Parks Canada and the Canadian Wildlife Service, the conservation and protection of areas. Um, and DFO also has that authority to create marine protected areas as well. So just a reminder that, there, that we're all in this together and we all have a role as citizens to make sure that governments are actually being held accountable for the kind of decisions that we wanna see happen in the ocean. Next, Danielle. So we really want to reinforce why you should be involved. Uh, no matter who you are, no matter how much you know about the ocean, no matter where you live, um, individual and community voices are key to any of the decisions that, that will be made about ocean conservation in the coming years. And we think it's really important that you share your thoughts, that you help inform government. And this is the only way we will make change. And this is the only way we will encourage government to go in a better direction and improve conservation in the ocean around us, including the Bay of Fundy, is if we are making sure that you're sharing your thoughts with government uh, when they ask and also when they don't ask. Um, and, what we know from research around the world, uh, both terrestrial and ocean protected areas, is the protected areas that are supported and guided by local communities are more effective. They have more sustainable outcomes. Um, they're more likely, if they're supported by local communities, there's more likely to be more stewardship opportunities and people are going to be on the lookout for things that shouldn't be happening in the areas. And of course, you don't have to wait for a consultation to engage on marine issues. Uh, sometimes governments have specific consultations and, and it's important to participate when they do. But in between times, you can also participate and we'll tell you a little bit more about what that might look like um, in a bit. So something that we wanted to tell you is that the, D the D Department of Fisheries and Oceans Bay of Fundy network plan is ongoing and discussions may begin soon uh, or will begin soon. Um, we, we don't know exactly when this is happening, but we do know that they are discussing. They've been talking with uh, stakeholders and rights holders, uh, indigenous nations about uh, possible plant conservation plans for the Bay of Fundy. And we expect that uh, they will soon move into a more of a public consultation phase. Uh, so they're underway uh, and something is happening and there will be an opportunity for you to participate uh, over the coming months. Next, Danielle. So different ways that you can get involved in uh, letting your voice be heard, sharing what local knowledge you have, sharing with governments, what's important to you. Uh, make sure you contact decision makers um, regularly. Uh, during election campaigns is always a good time to let uh, people who are running for office know what's important to you. Uh, but once they're in office, it's also good to let them know, send them emails, write a letter, um, phone their office if something is happening particularly urgently that that they need to know about that you would like to see addressed. Uh, ask for meetings. Participate in government consultations when they happen. This is really important that when government does ask, because it isn't always that frequent when governments um, go out to the public and ask them about specific environmental or conservation issues, and certainly in the ocean, it's um, much more rare, has been more rare. Um, because the people who are organizing the public consultations need to be able to show their bosses and the people who are calling the shots and deciding where money gets spent, 
that it's worth it to go out and ask the public and to actually organize a public consultation, whether it's open houses and meetings, uh, public meetings, or whether it's on mainly online, or maybe the opportunities are are different uh, every time they do a different consultation. But they need to be able to show that the public actually wants to participate in something and that the public will participate if government makes the investment in a consultation process. So we're hoping that a consultation process will start over the coming months uh, about the Bay of Fundy and conservation decisions that will be made there. And so we're encouraging all of you to participate and show government that when they ask, the public does have opinions that they want to um, put forward and also local knowledge that's also very important and useful to the whole planning process, the conservation planning process. And you can follow us, uh, CPAWS New Brunswick, uh, online or um, on, our, on our website and social media and other environmental organizations who also work on these issues to, because we will tell you when there's an opportunity for you to be consulted, for you to put your information into government, and we'll also try to provide tools that make it easy for you to do that and the kind of information that will be helpful to you so you don't feel like you're going in cold and that you actually feel prepared and, oh, okay, CPAWS has put out there what their key messages are. Those sound good to me. I'll, I'll just elaborate on them a little bit um, so that you're not feeling intimidated and, and feel like, oh, I don't know enough about this. I, how could I possibly have enough to say to the government to make a difference? And believe me, every single voice makes a difference. I know from talking to people who work in government and people, politicians over the years that when people actually participate and provide their input to governments, it makes a difference. Um, sometimes it stops things from going in the wrong direction, um, and often it will support things that are going in, a, in the right direction. So, and make sure that they do happen and, and keep the momentum up. So it's really important to do that. So how to have your voice heard. Um, Keep it simple. Don't get distracted by a whole bunch of other uh, other topics that aren't germane to the, the topic at hand. If you're talking about the Bay of Fundy and ocean, keep it to that and, and don't get distracted by um, a lot of the other issues that you would also like to communicate to the government. Do that separately. Um, if you have local stories, they can be very impactful to decision makers. If uh, areas are special to your family, or if you have a historical connection to certain areas, or you have a lot of local knowledge about an area or indigenous knowledge about an area, really important. And, and get the facts straight uh, to the extent that you can. Talk to the right person. Make sure that you're, if it's not on a consultation process and you don't actually know who you're supposed to be communicating with, uh, communicate with us and we'll help you figure out if um, you're, you're writing your letter to the right level of government or the right government official or the right minister. Um, and we have on our website, uh, speak up for nature toolkit that we've created. And, um, that's the link to it, uh, on our website right there at the bottom of this slide. And it has a lot of different ideas, ways that you can communicate with decision makers and make sure that your voice gets heard and that they pay attention to it. Next. So we have a few key takeaways. And the first is that governments are planning ocean conservation in the Bay of Fundy. If you didn't know it before, now you do. And uh, they've been busily working. Uh, the, the federal government, in fact, uh, the first time that I can remember this happening, that the Department of Fisheries and Oceans has been working in partnership with Parks Canada and the Canadian Wildlife Service, and they've all put their heads together and all their experts have been working together to look at what could be done for conservation in the Bay of Fundy, and especially with respect to protecting specific habitats. And so that's exciting and, and new movement at the federal government level. And they've also been communicating with the provinces on, on what they would like to see happen. So that's the first takeaway. The second is that your voices are 
important always. And governments need to hear from you always. And um, we're getting into election season in New Brunswick. And then the following year, it will probably be the federal government election. So this is a really important time for you to um, build your confidence, build your knowledge. We're here to help you. We want to make sure that we are doing what we can to raise everybody's voices up and uh, allow everybody to participate in the way that they want to in um, these different opportunities to talk to decision makers or people who want to become decision makers. So that's really important. And I can't stress it enough that you can't leave it all up to the governments to make decisions all by themselves. And you can't leave it all up to NGOs like us to carry the ball for you all, even though we do as much as we can. Um, the more individual voices that they hear from in all of their communities, that is really important to carry the day for conservation. Which is why number three takeaway is you should participate in the public consultations because we wanna make sure that we wanna reinforce to governments, yes, the public does wanna participate in consultations. They do have information to relate to governments and uh, they do have opinions on the topics that governments are working on. And just so that if we, if we stop participating, then they will stop asking. And we definitely don't want that to happen. So I'm, I'm putting another pitch in for making sure that when consultations happen sometime over the coming months about the Bay of Fundy and conservation, that you all uh, do the best you can to participate and um, use us as a resource to make sure that you feel comfortable and confident in doing that. Okay. I'll hand it back to Danielle for the questions. Great, thanks Roberta. So this brings us to the end of our presentation. We now have time for um, some questions, any questions that you have for us about anything that we presented on, about upcoming consultations that we can do our best to answer. Um, feel free if you want to um, put your question in the chat, or if you want to raise your hand and ask a question, um, we'll get um, uh, my colleague Riley just to help with um, any questions. If any hands are raised, I just can't see them on my end. So yeah, thanks so much, everyone. And we'll watch for questions in the chat or if you want to raise your hand to ask a question. Yeah, so we have a question from uh, Mark. He has his hand raised. So if you want, feel free to unmute yourself and ask go away. <laughs> Mark Leger here. here. Um, kind of wearing two hats here. I'm a coastal landowner and um, I also uh, do trail development. So I have multiple trail projects um, following the coastline in the southeast of the province. One of my biggest concerns right now and continues to be a concern is invasive species. Um, one of the more um, concerning is uh, Phragmites. I am troubled by the lack of, re and I think that's something that's going to continue to spread uh, through via the Bay of Fundy, especially the upper Bay of Fundy and uh, downward. Um, I'm really troubled by the lack, and Invasive Zen B has done a fantastic job of getting word out that, that this is an issue. I'm not sure where to turn uh, when I find it or what to do when I find it to have the resources to address it in the right way. Um, I live in the city of Moncton. It's all over the waterfront. Um, is can you provide some direction on where that is in terms of conservation and and resources that could be on the on the rise to address um, getting rid of some of these invasives? Well, um, hi Mark, good to see you. Um, that's not our area of expertise at CPAWS. Uh, we we uh, rely upon the New Brunswick Invasive Species Council to be on top of a lot of the activities that are going on with respect to invasive species, and I think they do an excellent job of keeping on top of uh, many of those issues, and they usually have on their website and their social media access to resources for people, information about the different invasive species. 
I don't know if they're following Phragmites. I, I assume they are. I haven't necessarily seen specifically uh, posts about that from them. Uh, but that would be my first port of call for information about that, uh, that particular invasive species issue. Uh, anybody else um, know anything about this? Uh, there are lots of people on the participant list who may also know something about this. <laughs> Mark, I don't know if that responded uh, enough. I didn't see anybody um, else uh, piping no, up. I, to I, say I, it was kind of a question, but also just kind of wanted to raise it as I think that's one of the, um, okay. for my part of the Bay of Fundy, I think one of the, the biggest uh, concerns by many and, and uh, okay. raising awareness is certainly a big part of it, but I'm not sure that we've moved on to that step of, it's so intensive, the work to, to address it is so intensive Yes, that um, that I'm very con and it's spreading. You know, every passing moment, it's spreading. So I, I just uh, I thought just to flag that as an issue that other people might be noting, uh, but also to uh, to say that there's definitely a need um, for more resources, whether that's through Invasives ND or or any other entity. Yeah, and there are some people putting some things in the chat there, so they have found some links of uh, tracking Phragmites. And I agree that those would be things that government also needs to be investing in. Great. Alrighty. And, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, Nat, I just saw that your hand was up one to see if there was anything else you wanted to add to the conversation on that, but I also see that you added some stuff to the chat as well. Okay, great, thanks. Alrighty, so the next question was from uh, Tony Diamond, and he said that you pointed out musquash as an MPA, but also said that there was currently no ocean protection. How can there be no M in MPA? <laughs> Great. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, yeah, I guess sort of we, we shared that um, with the intention of saying that there's very little, uh, not saying that there's absolutely none, there's very little protection right now. The Musquash is the only um, marine protected area um, and it's close into the into the shore. It's not extending out very far into the bay. Um, if you looked at a map, it's um, uh, it's the estuary and, and following some of the um, sort of tributaries that come into um, along the coast, um, but it's not extending out very um, far into the ocean. So that is a good point that um, while technically there there is some, but it's it's not much protection of, of the Bay of Fundy yet. Yeah, good question. Roberta, Great. anything else you wanted to add? No, nope, that's true. <laughs> Great. Perfect. Perfect. So we have another question from Carol. Um, just curious, have you had any indication of what type of consultation the government is planning? Online, web page, uh, in-person discussion, etc. I think you mentioned it, but which government of Canada department would be the lead? And then she also thanked us for the informative webinar. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thanks, Carol. Um, the uh, it, the lead department is the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, uh, working in partnership with CWS and Parks Canada. Um, but DFO will be the place where uh, news will come from uh, when it starts, and we're on top we're on top of it to the best extent we can be, and. Um, we will let everybody know. So if you follow us on social media, we'll let everybody know when that moment comes. But of course, you can also be paying attention to DFO's uh, pages as well. And we we still don't know uh, what form. At the very least, we know that there will be web and online options. Um, and uh, there, there may be specific detailed ways of doing that, of sending that information in. They may construct specific pathways, um, openings for people to send their information. And um, otherwise, it's still in the, in the decision-making phase as to what it's going to look like and uh, when it will be happening.
Great. And then we have another question from uh, Debbie. She uh, says, does sea farming, uh, so fish, seaweed, urchin farming, have a negative impact on biodiversity in the Bay of Fundy, or do the regulations of that industry promote sustainability? Hi, Debbie. Thanks for a hard question. Um, uh, so, um, yes, uh, fish, fish aquaculture is is um, tough. It's um, it's got a lot of impacts on the ecosystem, and CFOS doesn't consider it to be compatible with marine protected areas. So we would hope that um, the marine protected areas that we hope will get established in the Bay of Fundy will avoid those areas where finfish aqua, open net pen finfish aquaculture is happening. Um, there are different, different kinds of aquaculture of different impacts. And I must admit, I don't know, maybe other people on, the, on this uh, call do know more about the urchins. Um, I think it depends upon how urchin harvesting is being done. So there's urchin harvesting and then there, there that's what I've heard more about. And I guess it depends upon how it's actually being done and whether there are um, what kinds of tools are being used to harvest. Uh, some sea urchin harvesting could be done by hand picking. I've heard of that happening in other parts of the world. Um, not sure that that's what's going on here. Um, so that's what I know about that, but we would be hoping that um, any of those activities, especially the ones that are really in place, like the open net pen aquaculture sites, which are in situ there and they don't move around much, um, would be avoided with any uh, marine protected areas that might happen. And Nicole Levitt has got some information in the chat. Thanks, Nicole. Happy to see you here. Um, for those who want to learn more about the, the other sea urchin activities that are going on. Great. And then we have a question from Matt. Uh, says, this may not be the place to ask, but just wondering if there is any planned volunteering outings for cleanup or conservation. Yeah, great question. Yeah, great question. Um, there, um, yeah, I guess there's a, a handful of different um, environmental organizations across New Brunswick that do different, um, that have different volunteer opportunities um, coming up uh, with CPAWS. We will have some, um, not volunteer, but some outdoor um, activities in the summer to, um, to get out. Uh, cleanups are, are sometimes a part of the activities that we run. There's other organizations um, that I can think of um, that um, individual communities might be running cleanups, like Nat's added to the chat there. Um, I believe it's the Nature Trust that runs uh, the Fundy Coastal Cleanup that happens normally in August. Um, so uh, yeah, following ourselves, like CPAWS, we always share when different opportunities like that come up on our social media, as well as our uh, email newsletter, as well as other organizations that are local to you right in your communities um, might be running similar uh, cleanups or events to get out and um, explore some of the, the coastal uh, habitats that we have and, and do cleanup while you're while you're out enjoying nature as well. Yeah, great question. And we usually do have a number of coastal activities, whether it's walks or other seashore explorers and other activities. Uh, especially in some of the coastal parks during the summer. So you can be on the lookout for that on our social media. Great. So that's all the questions we have right now in the chat. So if anybody else has any questions, feel free to raise your hand or, or type them in. I, I have some questions for the participants if none of the participants have any questions because the things that I'm always wondering about are um, whether people actually 
think of themselves as wanting to participate in these kinds of consultations and whether you feel what kind of information you feel like you need and um, those are things that we're always wondering about because we want to provide the right kind of information, not too much, not an overwhelming amount, um, but the kinds of, of things you wonder about that you might want some questions answered from us so that we provide the, the right kind of key messages and documents to you during a consultation process. Great. Maybe if anyone, maybe we can start with if anyone has participated in um, government consultations related to different um, conservation work or protected areas. Uh, if anyone has had that experience of participating in a consultation, and maybe you can share um, what you would find helpful from CPAWS um, to be able to participate in upcoming or, or future consultations. So while people are thinking about that, um, uh, so one of the things that we've been thinking about is um, that we know that several years back, um, Department of Fisheries and Oceans researchers produced a report on the Bay of Fundy that identified a number of ecologically and biologically significant areas. And we're going to be pulling together some information about each of those and trying to distill it into something that's um, publicly accessible and easy to digest and understand. And uh, so that's one piece of work that we're planning to do uh, and have ready for whenever the consultation happens. Um, and also interested to hear from other people if there are specific areas that you think are important to be conserved, um, because we'll be sure to put that information into our own submissions as well. And the ecologically and biologically significant areas include places like um, the inner bay of Fundy, including both the uh, Sheffield Bay area on the New Brunswick side and the Minas Basin on the Nova Scotia side, which are of course very important for the mudflats and the shorebird habitats, uh, as well as the many other uh, important ecological features. And, and then the Quadi region is um, one of those ecologically and biologically significant areas that has uh, been identified so many times as being incredibly productive and important for all kinds of wildlife species. Um, and so those are areas and, and some an area um, around specific areas, especially lobster nursery habitats around Grand Banana Island. And um, Mesa's Bay has been identified as being uh, very important for a number of ecological features. Um, those are the ones that are off the top of my head. Yeah, so we did have um, Carol send another message in the chat saying that that uh, she thought that it would be helpful to know the key issues and what's in and out of the scope for the consultation process. Okay. And something else that everybody should know is um, when we're talking about protected areas in the Bay of Fundy, obviously there are a number of coastal fisheries that are going on in the Bay of Fundy and we at CPAWS are really, think it's really important that uh, the marine protected areas are not um, unduly negatively impacting uh, the coastal fisheries that exist and Canada has um, minimum standards for their marine protected areas that uh, include 
no dragging, no dumping, no dredging, um, no oil and gas development, no um, mining. Those are the kinds of activities that are the, the baseline minimum standards for what would constitute a marine protected area. And um, so as long as there, we're not talking about fixed gear uh, fishing, then they should be and, and could be compatible with marine protected areas, depending upon the sensitivity of the habitats in those areas. So it's highly likely that lobster fishing is not going to be uh, prohibited in most of the marine protected areas, I expect, in the Bay of Fundy. And um, because we know that lobster fishing and a lot of the other coastal fisheries are important to uh, coastal economies and to the New Brunswick economy and, and also the, the uh, cultures of our communities. So we want to make sure that marine protected areas are helping to um, support sustainable fisheries and are protecting areas that are important so that fish can, um, fish stocks can be rebuilt and that they can heal from past damage or from even the impacts of climate change and a warming bay. And uh, these are some of the issues that we think people need to be thinking about too, is that balancing act um, because we need to look after the ecosystem in order for it to be providing us with um, things that we may call resources or things that we might want to be harvesting from the bay. Uh, so a couple of messages in the chat here. Um, one from Debbie saying that some years ago I took part with a group of my students students in a public consultation se session about forest harvesting sustainability found that the politicians who we presented to were unable to answer our questions, uh, yet they were going to be the ones making decisions going forward. Do you think that that could be a similar case with the consultations about to happen in the Bay of Fundy? Well, this is uh, the push and pull with um, decision making. So there are a lot of experts who work for these government departments who um, probably could answer all of those questions. Um, and it's their job to be providing the kind of information up the chain to decision makers so that decision makers have all the information that they need to make the right kind of decisions. Um, so, and, and of course, decision makers have different levels of uh, interest and, and take their jobs um, seriously to different degrees. So it does depend upon decision makers to make sure that they're listening and asking the right questions of their staff. But also this is why it's really important that we're um, talking to the staff people if we have opportunities. So a lot of the information that goes into public consultation goes to the staff first. And if it's um, a website or an online portal or emails, um, but communicating directly with the decision makers is important too. And so that they hear directly from citizens what we expect of them when they're making decisions. And so if we think that marine protection and then marine protected areas and conserving specific habitats is important, they need to hear from us directly. And also the staff need to know that we are supportive of plans that they're putting forward and that we have local knowledge that can also be added and help to tweak the plans. So it's, uh, it's this constantly um, communicating with uh, government at all the different levels where information and decisions are being discussed and Sometimes people wait until there's an election before they talk to the people who, who are want to be elected or um, are going to be making decisions. And that's, we can't keep doing that. We need to be talking to ministers and reminding them all the time about conservation, because I can guarantee you that the people who are um, using natural resources, the people who are part of industries, 
where natural resources are part of the mix um, are talking, have staff people talking to politicians all the time or very often. And uh, so it's up to us to make sure that the balance is there and that they're also hearing from people who uh, care deeply about conservation and that our expectations are that those ministers will be doing that balancing and also protecting the baseline natural habitat that is allowing all of these industries to either flourish or not. So um, we have Nat also from the NDN uh, mentioning their concerns about the East Coast shoreline, uh, partly because of the megastorms they're seeing coming through. Uh, so little of the shorelines are accessible due to private property. Um, they would like to see more protected parks like Kujuaquak and just general concern about the amount of forests that have been clear cut and just the overall importance of connectivity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and this is important and um, make no mistake that even though this is about the Bay of Fundy and, and this is about oceans, um, we at TPAWS are constantly trying to de-silo the way that people think about habitats and ecosystems because they are all connected as Danielle talked about earlier in the presentation and we know it. And it's just that governments are broken up into these different departments and they've got jurisdictions over different um, e kinds of ecosystems. And uh, this, this creates a kind of um, separation in the way that decisions are made so that we aren't thinking about it holistically and we aren't thinking about it as one big habitat, one big ecosystem, as we know is the case. And, and so we keep trying to remind the people who are managing terrestrial protected areas that they're right next to an ocean, if they're right next to an ocean or a water body that may or may not be part of their jurisdiction of the department that they work for, but it's still important that they be conserved together and we be need to be thinking about them as, as one whole. And um, this is a challenge, uh, but it doesn't hurt if members of the public are also bringing that up too. And so don't get fooled into thinking that you have to only talk about ocean issues if it's a coastal area and there's an impact that's happening on land that is uh, important to discuss. Alrighty, so um, we do have uh, one more question in the chat and then Mark, I'll get to you in just a second. Uh, so uh, asking, what do you know about the conservation of the inner bay salmon species in the causeway at Windsor with respect to a blocked water flow and closed gate? Is this something that CPAWS is concerned about? Hmm. Um, yes. And I don't know if somebody from CPAWS Nova Scotia is here or not, but they may know something about that because Windsor is outside of my patch a little bit. <laughs> um, even though I'm talking about not being in silos, uh, I also, also, we are in the New Brunswick chapter, we can't be everywhere. Um, so there is a Nova Scotia chapter of CPAWS as well that is um, working on us with Bay of, on Bay of Fundy issues. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of really good in, uh, work being done on Air Bay of Fundy salmon in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, uh, but that sounds like a um, an issue. And for both outer Bay of Fundy salmon and inner Bay of Fundy salmon, barriers are a big problem. Looks like Ange is putting something in the chat there. Yeah, we have Ange from CPAWS Nova Scotia saying definitely on the radar, letter currently being written. <laughs> okay. And you can also unmute yourself if you have anything <laughs> you want to say. Yeah, I can super quick just say um, Oceans North is taking the lead on constructing a letter and getting a number of signatories um, from local NGO groups um, around to sign that. And this is something that they've done in the past as well. So this is like another letter. This is something that's constantly on the radar and 
um, yeah, lots of pressure mounting on that currently. So yeah, um, on, on the radar and thanks for bringing that up. Great. So uh, I see Mark put his hand down. I'm not sure if that means that maybe the question was answered or maybe not. Just going to give him a second if he wants to, sure. uh, to speak. Yeah. <laughs> I just, just wanted to quickly echo what Roberta was saying, you know, calls, letters, emails from individuals. Uh, we may not think it has an impact. It most certainly does, especially yeah. to your local leaders. It absolutely does. I know it firsthand. Um, I want to point, I'm a civil servant, um, and I know that it's painful how slow progress is made. It's gr it's a grind, but we need to, as much as we need to hold people to account and criticize and ask for better, we should celebrate progress. And we made massive strides uh, with, it's not where we need to be, it's, it's a long ways from it, but it was massive progress with conservation in New Brunswick over the past few years. And we need to send letters and make phone calls and point out when progress is made and celebrate that. Because if they get silence when they make progress, and it, it, then, then they're not motivated to go further. So I think yeah. that's as important, possibly more, that great job. You, we got so much further to go. Let's keep at it. Yeah. And CPAWS did have a, an action on our website that people could take to send letters of support uh, and thank you to the government for the terrestrial protected areas that were established um, over the last few years. And uh, so the province of New Brunswick did reach 10% of the province in protected areas, which is a huge leap forward. And it, we're still not, uh, we're still behind a lot of the other provinces in Canada, but it was a big leap forward for New Brunswick. And, and I think that it is important and, and I will reinforce that, Mark, that I know it's important for politicians because if they don't get <clears throat> kudos when they do something good, the likelihood that they will go out on a limb and do something good again <laughs> shrinks. And uh, so when they're doing something that you don't want, is tell them when they've done something that you do want to have happen, Make sure you tell them that you've noticed it because um, there are a lot of complicated discussions that go on internally inside governments and sometimes to make big decisions like that about protected areas people actually have to try and convince other people who are a little bit more reluctant to actually go out on a limb and do it and um, the only way they can do that is they say, look, voters want this, they'll like it, they'll thank you for it. Um, and and if, the, if that part doesn't come through, it makes it harder the next time. So thanks for bringing that up, Mark. I, I appreciate that. It's, uh, it's a big deal. We can't just talk amongst ourselves. We need to talk to the people that sometimes we don't agree with all the time. Awesome. And then uh, we just have more of a comment left in the chat about how the importance of addressing uh, debris that is left in the oceans from the fishing industry. Uh, the term that some people might not be familiar with, ghost gear, uh, that's stuff that's either discarded intentionally or just left behind accidentally. Uh, so just kind of the importance of acknowledging that. Yeah. And I agree. That's, that's really important. And the way I think about it is marine protected areas are a baseline that we need to have as part of a whole package of tools that we use to conserve the ocean. And part of it is we stop putting junk in the ocean um, and just leaving it there. And um, that and, and that includes also stop putting pollution and toxins into the ocean. And so there are all kinds of other tools, conservation tools that can be used. Protected areas are the baseline to help protect the baseline habitats and, and the, the column of water, the whole, all the way to the top um, as protected areas as well. And we still need to be on top of all of the other things that happen outside those protected areas and that will impact those protected areas over time. And so littering and and ghost gear and um, dumping 
and other activities are things that we still need to have rules and regulations to control. And so it doesn't, marine protected areas don't let governments off the hook for all those other things. We also need to be paying attention to them as well. But without protected areas and protecting that baseline, those baseline habitats, the nursery areas, the bottom habitats that are really sensitive where a lot of baby fish um, live and find uh, refuge. We need to protect those areas uh, as a way of helping the ocean heal itself. And that's the first uh, a step, but protecting wildlife from all of the other things, impacts with ships and um, that's important as well. So, um, by not mentioning those things, it's not that we don't think they're important. It's that uh, we were just zooming in on the protected areas and protecting specific habitats for this particular webinar. Thanks for bringing that up. Absolutely. I think it's an important reminder that we um, sometimes talk about it as a, as a big puzzle where marine protected areas are one piece to the puzzle and, and other forms of management and, and other actions that we can all take as individuals or other pieces to this overall puzzle of, of helping nature around us, that it's a, it's a great point. There's so many different ways that we can be addressing and, and having a, a positive impact on, on nature around us and um, where marine protected areas are, are the one puzzle piece that we, we really focus on it at CPAWS New Brunswick. And like Roberta said, not to say that anything else isn't, uh, that, that there's different levels of importance, but that um, it's it's an overall sort of puzzle we're working towards of, of helping all of nature. Okay. Are there any other questions? People can feel free to put them in the chat or um, if you'd still like to raise your hand and, and ask any questions, feel free to take yourselves off mute. We'll give folks another, say, 30 seconds to think of any last questions before we wrap up. And of course, if something comes to you later that you wish you'd ha have asked a question about or something that you start thinking about um, over the coming weeks, please feel free to send us messages on social media um, or uh if you, you have any of our email addresses to us directly, we really do um, pay a close attention to the things that people are wondering about because we wanna make sure that any materials that we're providing, that we're producing, awareness raising materials, things that are on our website, we wanna make sure that we're helping to address the, uh, the things that people are actually wondering about, the questions that people have, so that it becomes easier and easier for you to engage with decision makers as when the, whenever you want to, and whether the, whenever the opportunities arise. Great, well, thank you so much, everyone. Maybe we'll, yeah. we'll wrap up here. Um, just want to um, make another um, reminder to um, be yeah, following us on social media, subscribing to our uh, e-news, to our, um, our email newsletter is the best way to stay up to date with different ways that you can take action with different campaigns that we're running. Um, if we feel it's an important time to be sending off letters to uh, the government, to different decision makers, or when these public consultations become available and, and are open for uh, people to participate in, um, will be posted on social media, but we'll also be sending lots of information through our, our e-newsletter as well. So Riley has put a link to that in the chat that you can go and subscribe there. Um, thank you again, everyone for joining and thank you, um, especially to the NBEN for helping us put this on. Um, to Lily, Nat, and Zahira for being on the call today and supporting us uh, behind the scenes, as well to our interpreters. Uh, thank you so much for all of your support on this event today.